Hello! Today I'm taking a look at Ghost of Tsushima, a 2020 adventure game by Sucker Punch based loosely around historical events in 13th century Japan. Now, kicking off on a bit of a personal note, this game was something of a welcome surprise for me, since I wasn't aware of its existence until about three days before it was released. And as soon as I became aware of it, and I started noticing the advertising and, and reading details around the title, it was one of those moments where I didn't realise how much I'd been wanting something until, until I'd actually seen it. And what I mean by that is games rooted in a, in a Japanese and particularly a, a feudal Japanese or samurai setting are quite few and far between. Um, and they are generally implemented with varying degrees of success, whether it's gameplay, story, or capturing some historical semblance of Japan you know, whether it's historical accuracy or aesthetically. And to this end, I've personally always enjoyed the Tenchu games and their ability to weave fact and fiction together, you know, taking the tumultuous historical period uh, of the Sengoku period and introducing subtle elements of fantasy and folklore into the episodic stealth gameplay. And beyond Tenchu, you know, of course, we've seen a handful of other decent titles emerge over time, including uh, Onimusha, uh, Nio, and Sekiro, which each vary in, in how they deliver on historicity, gameplay, and their take on their Japanese source material. But turning to Ghost of Tsushima, we find a game that, perhaps more than any other recent title taking Feudal Japan as a setting, was really invested in bringing historical cultural and pop cultural sources into the game experience to create something that was both enjoyable and immersive. And everything from gameplay mechanics through to story, UI, sound design, is augmented by and resides in this effort to conjure ideas of, of a particular time and place. And I think it crafts a very comprehensive aesthetic that elevates Ghost of Tsushima uh, above your run-of-the-mill you know, action-adventure game. So in this episode, I'll be taking a look at aspects of setting and story through to gameplay and design, and really kind of break it down and appreciate uh, what I think sets this title apart as a, as a contemporary game experience. Now, kicking off, Ghost of Tsushima is a game that traded brilliantly on the popular idea of Japan in the collective consciousness. And as I've touched on, each facet of the game experience works to elicit these romantic notions of the culture in a very specific way. For example, just looking at the reward systems for players, you know, and particularly around exploration, we have scenic spots where our character Jin can sit and write a haiku or bathe in a hot spring, which are cultural nods to popular ideas of, of feudal Japanese practices. And we also have fox dens, in which friendly, slightly anthropomorphised foxes guide us to Inari shrines, which are nods to both the Shintoist belief system uh, and also Japanese folklore, in which the goddess Inari is associated with foxes and they are worshipped as, as you know, fort fortuitous creatures. And of course, in this, they kind of guide us to, to bonuses. So even right down to these small elements and, and micro-interactions and incidental elements of the game, we have an experience that is considered and reflective of its subject matter. And it's just one example of how Sucker Punch sought to elicit the essence of Japan in Ghost of Tsushima through much more than simply setting and, and story. Now, on the note of setting and, and taking a step back to consider all these cultural and historical nods uh, included in the game, Ghost of Tsushima is set in a very particular time and place in the world, and a very particular historical event, uh, which is the first Mongol invasion of Japan in the latter 13th century. Now, when I started this title, you know, began playing through it, I thought it was a very interesting event to base the game around, as it's not a, period, a piece of history that one necessarily immediately associates with Japan and, and thinks of when they think about Japan. And as I was playing through and experiencing the story and observing the emerging themes, I began to appreciate why this event might have been chosen and how it contributed so well to the overall 
atmosphere of the game experience. Firstly, this is a game that focuses heavily on the societal conditions and culture of feudal Japan, and specifically on the samurai, which is a, a unique class of people with a certain way of life and a certain way of doing things. And I think the best way to really amplify that and communicate that is by contrasting the samurai with a completely different culture, you know, a foreign other. And, you know, this immediately presents difficulties, historically speaking, because the reason Japan is so unique and has remained so culturally intact over the centuries is the fact that they have never been outrightly invaded or conquered, you know, as a nation. And particularly while the samurai were at their peak, you know, beyond some skirmishing with China and Korea, the clans and shoguns of Japan spent more time fighting amongst themselves than any external cultural force. And indeed, just relating back to Tenchu, you know, this series is set during the Sengoku period, where we find in those games that many of our enemies are either outrightly fantasy creatures or they are domestic Japanese, our assassination targets. And that's precisely because, you know, Japan has always been relatively isolationist um, and it was a period that was defined almost exclusively by civil war rather than any foreign interactions. So I think Ghost of Tsushima did well to zero in on one of the very few examples of a cultural clash between a foreign invader and the samurai and it really helped emphasise the uniqueness and the distinguishing features of the samurai class and it really drives the immersion and the intrigue and the aesthetic uh, of the overall game experience. Now, the slight inconvenience of the Mongol invasions uh, as a setting and a historical period is that the samurai as we know them today were still quite a fledgling emerging phenomena at this period of time, and they had only been around for about, you know, 80, maybe 90 years as an overtly, you know, stable militaristic force. And it was only in the Kamakura period which began just shortly before Ghost of Tsushima is set, that we saw the now legendary Minamoto clan emerge out of a civil war and essentially overthrow the emperor uh, and the aristocracy to establish a samurai-led shogunate. And this is basically how the samurai were established as we think about them in the, the popular consciousness. And it's what made them become you know, a permanent warrior class rather than bureaucrats and retainers for nobles, which is how they had previously been you know, set up in society. So what this means is, you know, a lot of the popular ideas and images of the samurai wouldn't have existed at the time of the Mongol invasion. And it does hint at where Ghost of Tsushima has taken a few artistic liberties to improve the familiarity and the flow of the game. And for example, we have these popular notions of honour and selflessness, which are closely bound up with the samurai. And a way of living that was later codified and officiated um, as Bushido in the 1600s. And to this end, you know, on the one hand, uh, yes, uh, Zen Buddhism and all these influences for Bushido were beginning to spread among the samurai during the Kamakura period and at the time Ghost of Tsushima is set. And this did inform conduct on the battlefield and acceptance of death and that sort of thing. But to what extent it reflected the very nuanced and ritualized formality of Bushido, um, such as we see in Ghost of Tsushima, I'm not sure how far along that would have been, you know, at this time. Because during this period, we do have records that show that the samurai were still very brutal, you know, bloodthirsty people. Um, and for example, one of the key ways to earn prestige in battle was by decapitating as many enemies as possible. And they would display the heads of enemies, you know, around their horse, which was a sign of, you know, their success and their prowess. And if we fast forward and look at the 17th century, when Bushido was established properly, you know, we still have decapitation as an aspect of samurai culture. But rather than this vindictive battle trophy, as it formerly had been, it had evolved under Bushido to be performed as a much more ceremonial act of mercy. Uh, for samurai that were committing ritual suicide. So, moving on, and a very final point on history, since we're talking about swords and rituals and stuff, uh, 
Ghost of Tsushima also portrays the use of the infamous katana, which, again, was a sword that is synonymous with the samurai class. And yet the existence of the katana at the time of the Mongol invasion is highly debated to this day. And, you know, some historians believe that the process of making the katana, which is like folded steel or something, it was only developed after the Mongol invasion and precisely because of the Mongol invasion, since the earlier Tashi blades used to break against the Mongol armour, is one story. But uh, personally speaking, I mean, I don't know how true that is, and without getting too pedantic, you know, I'm sure I've seen museum displays which describe both Tashi and Katan swords being equally popular and equally used among the samurai, you know, during the Kamakura period. But regardless of the actual chronology of the swords. I think something Ghost of Tsushima did really well with its weaponry, um, and inching into gameplay here, was reducing Jin's primary arsenal and his primary re- weapons down to simply a long sword coupled with a Tanto short sword. Because it's common these days to see samurai depicted with three swords, a long sword, a mid-sized wakazashi, uh, and the small Tanto. But once again, leaning into historical accuracy, and looking at the time, it's prudent to note that the Wakazashi wasn't developed until decades and decades after the Mongol invasion, um, and that was actually a, a natural development of the Tanto, which became reduced to a, a more ceremonial blade that you know we see for the suicides and stuff like that. But you know, I liked how Ghost of Tsushima was in keeping with the time, and also kind of complemented and simplified the gameplay by just having two swords. You know, one for the assassination stuff, which was the Tanto. And then the the long katana for you know general combat and gameplay, and again we have the auxiliary stuff like the longbow, which was favoured by the samurai, and we see other characters utilising the naganata spears and, and other things that were known to have been used at the time. So there's plenty of other examples of this historical hybridising that Ghost of Tsushima employed, uh, and I'm going to move on now from this rather pedantic ramble about swords, but I think that's enough to really exemplify the conflict between the chosen historical setting and the desire to marry it with more popular and accepted ideas of the samurai that a modern audience might reasonably associate and expect from a samurai-focused game. And I want to stress here that these observations aren't criticisms either, uh, and quite to the contrary. Where Assassin's Creed games, for example, traded quite largely on their commitment to historical accuracy by, for example, painstakingly recreating events and architecture of Damascus or Florence or, you know, wherever the game happens to be set. There was no similar statement of intent or requirement uh, for Ghost of Tsushima to pursue this degree of painstaking authenticity. And personally, I think the game succeeds precisely because it strays slightly from reality and and history. And what it does brilliantly is combine more fantastical and folkloric and idealistic images of Japan, you know, such as were romanticised by Edo period painters like Hokusai, who, for their part, kind of created much more rose-tinted theatrical views of ancient Japan, in much the same way that Western Renaissance painters reshaped ideas and romanticised Greek antiquity or stories from the Bible. And so I think, you know, the writers utilised this and drew on this and combined it with a more modern pop cultural view um, and distinctly cinematic view of the samurai too, uh, with perhaps the most obvious nod being to the cinematic oeuvre of uh, Akira Kurosawa. Now, moving on from setting, these Edo period and cinematic flourishes inch into the aesthetics, uh, the gameplay and the visual composition of the game too. For example, Kurosawa mode, which switches the game from vibrant painterly colours to a grainy monochrome UI, has clear nods to Yojimbo, Seven Samurai, and the legendary mid-century films of Akira Kurosawa. Furthermore, in instances where Jin is beginning a one-on-one battle, for example, we see close-up cinematics of these two combatants measuring one another before, you know, gradually thumbing his katana out of its sheath, which is straight out of the cinematic vocabulary that we see in, 
Kurosawa films um, and wider samurai media. The Bushido mindset, sleight of hand, and mastery of swordplay that we see here has been immortalised by cinematic technique and passed down from Kurosawa through to Takashi Miike, Yoji Yamada, Takeshi Kitano, and many other filmmakers, and has for a while now inched into the mechanics of video games, such as Ghost of Tsushima. But I think in Ghost of Tsushima specifically, it's expertly used to augment the experience and the gameplay, with another great example being the enemy standoffs, in which the player can deliver decisive killing blows to several enemies almost instantaneously, leaving them hovering for a moment before they fall down dead. And this is a distinctly Japanese thing, you know, that they, that is employed in samurai stories and samurai movies, and where by comparison, if we look at Chinese cinema and Hong Kong cinema, there's a heritage of very drawn-out ballet-esque combat sequences, often using string work and stuff like that, um, looking at Once Upon a Time in China or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you know, so on. However, by comparison, the dramatic conclusions in samurai movies are often quite the opposite, uh, and Takeshi Kitano's Zatoichi, as a prime example, has about two hours of fantastic narrative build-up to an inevitable showdown between two ronin, but the battle itself only lasts about two seconds, um, so it's great to see this maison-scene and choreography and expert swordplay you know, introduced into the, the gameplay in the style of Ghost of Tsushima. Beyond these combat elements that nod to a pop-cultural heritage of the samurai, another impressive design aspect of the game, which oddly grew to become one of my favourite aspects of it, was its attentiveness to costume and period attire, and I really enjoyed the process of unlocking the various outfits and colour combinations for Jin, which really reflect the vibrance and the clothwork and the patterns of the period, you know, such as we see depicted in the art of uh, Hiroshigi, uh, Hokusai, and other artists that, as I say, sort of romanticised earlier Japanese society. The vibrance of floating world art, as it's known, or yukioi painting, also inches into the sprawling vistas of Shishima Island. Mountainous Shinto shrines and autumnal forests result in a really rewarding and aesthetically pleasing environment to play through. And it's little wonder that Ghost of Shishima became as immensely popular as it did, you know, among virtual photographers, as they're called. And, you know, it's reaped rewards in art direction because it really was, you know, a beautiful sort of sprawling landscape. Now, let's shift on from setting and design and delve into the story here. And what I really enjoyed about Ghost of Tsushima is that despite its sprawling open world and character-driven side quests and rewards, is that the story boiled down to a really well-paced three-act structure, focusing on a single character's journey within a tumultuous time period. Its themes and narrative focus are perfectly balanced and interwoven between the personal plight of Jin and the wider events of the Mongol invasion. And I think part of the reason I like this so much is that it was a big step change from the sprawling, endless epics that are often attempted within the medium of gaming and this perceived formula that's emerged that game size and game length equates to value and for example, one of the criticisms levelled at Red Dead Redemption 2 upon its release was that it attempted to do too much with its drawn-out narrative and tangent plots and tangent gameplay mechanics, and so and so on and so on. And while I don't necessarily agree with that, and I really do like uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, you know, I've discussed it on the channel, I can appreciate the desire sometimes to just experience a story and not have too much filler or discursive plot lines or discursive mechanics to really detract or dilute from that core journey. So, moving on and, and looking at the central themes and the narrative thread of this game, at its core is the character of Jin Sakai and his desire to save his country from the Mongol forces that have all but overtaken Shishima Island as a strategic foothold in their intended invasion of mainland Japan. As such, we are thrust into events with an opening sequence that shows the samurai charge into battle and quickly get wiped out, with our hero Jin being one of the few survivors uh, to be rescued by the bandit Yuna. This opening set piece is excellent because it quickly establishes the context of events and Jin's status in society as a Japanese noble 
his decimated comrades in introduction to Yuna in the opening 20 minutes of the game, initiates what becomes his central thematic arc, which is the clash of ideology and identity crisis between the honourable proprieties of the samurai way and the more subversive ninja-esque methods employed by thieves and assassins, which is advocated by Yuna. Indeed, this is the very division that gives rise to the ghost persona, uh, the namesake of the game, which spreads through Shishima as a growing legend, and thus we have this internal crisis emerge between Jin the samurai and Ghost the assassin. Now, this was a great trajectory for the game story, and shows how simple themes, when employed well, can really craft a compelling story. And indeed, rather than the climax of the narrative coming with the demise of the villainous Mongol general, the true apex of Jin's story comes with Jin confronting his uncle, you know, Lord Shimura, who is both Jin's mentor, but also the avatar of samurai propriety, from which Jin has strayed throughout the game story. Now, before getting to the events that lead us to the end game, I think it's worth discussing this internal struggle and divisive nature of Jin in terms of gameplay, because early on I did wonder whether my playstyle, such as choosing to call out and confront enemies head-on, or sneak around assassinating them, was informing the trajectory of the story, because we have infrequent cutaways to Khan informing Lord Shimura that his soldiers have been assassinated, and, and various you know dialogues like this. And in conjunction with this, we have the different outfits available to Jin, which vary aesthetically, but generally fall within two categories, which is the more elegant, formal soldier attires, and the more stealth-orientated ninja attires, which advocate one or the other of these playstyles. So early on, I thought the game might operate on some branching arcs where playstyle and honour rating informs outcome, which is an increasingly popular mechanic that we've seen in everything from the Fallout games through to Red Dead Redemption. And I may have just been thinking in these terms because I had recently played um, Red Dead Redemption 2 prior to starting Ghost of Tsushima. So while it transpires that this is not quite the case and a branching story, such as we could call it, you know, boils down to one significant decision in the end game, I think it's actually good that they didn't overcomplicate the narrative with branching character trajectories based on gameplay or, or anything like this. Because what we have instead is firstly a very enjoyable game that you are free to navigate and, and play however you like, and also a very concisely structured story which brings Jin out of his known experience of the samurai and into the more subversive win at all costs ghost persona which sees him succeed against the Mongols, but at the expense of his values um, and his status within the social hierarchy of Japanese society. And it brought about this, you know, aforementioned contention with his uncle, which is everything kind of drives towards this this um, final point between Shimura and Jin. Now, if the story were to branch depending on player choice or gameplay, none of these interesting themes of, you know, identity and ideological politics would have been featured, you know, or at least not quite as prominently and without quite the same effect, particularly if a player chose to play by the rules, you know, as it were, and, and go through a, a samurai play style. So I suppose the point I'm making is I was just really glad that they boiled the game down to a comparatively straightforward decision in the end game and guide us through this linear journey as Jin throughout the, the majority of the game. You know, it was a very liberating and, and decom decomplexifying gameplay experience. In keeping with Jin's story, another key aspect of his character is this lingering rootlessness and shame that's bound up in childhood trauma. And periodic flashbacks reveal telling aspects of his past, such as his uncle educating him in the ways of the samurai, and more pressingly, his witnessing of his father's murder, which he arguably could have prevented. And some might question why the death of the father is significant to the overall story, and personally, I think it makes Jin slightly more susceptible to deviating from the samurai way, as there may naturally have been this sense of rootlessness and not belonging, and of course guilt that he is not truly honourable because he didn't 
you know, save his father or, or die trying. The flashbacks explaining all this contribute to the world building and character development of Jin, making his journey one of personal redemption as much as one of identity and deciding between two considerably different paths in life. As such, each significant decision he makes in the game has a degree of weight behind it, and often life and death decisions aren't taken lightly, which is a comparative change from other action-adventure games. For example, when we are onboarding to the assassination mechanic and Yuna tells us to start knifing guards with our Tanto, this isn't simply a tutorial, but it also works narratively, as Jin has a degree of hesitance about doing this and how it contradicts his upbringing as an honour-bound samurai. Indeed, periodically through the game, if we use a subversive or novel tactic to kill an enemy, such as leaping down to impale them, or using a bow and arrow, we cut to a flashback or voiceover of Lord Shimura, or one of our other mentors, you know, chastising us or explaining some contextual reference which is aligned to how the samurai would have done it, or, or the samurai way. And I think this stuff is also where we find value in the optional side quests with the five or six ancillary characters. Ishikawa, Lady Masako, Kenji, and so on, each offer intriguing tangents from the central plot, you know, dealing with their own dilemmas. And it contributes to the overall world building and, and characterization of time and place. But the side quests also reflect on Jin, his growth and his development as a character, you know, not to mention, of course, the various rewards and and the development of his skill set. Now, what I like about the conflict between the Bushido mindset and the Assassin's Code, if we can call it that, is that at no point throughout the game does the story advocate one or the other of these to the player. And I would argue that Lord Shimura at no point appears stubborn to the point of villainy, you know, in his confrontations with Jin. And that's what makes the final battle and, and the final decision in the game quite a weighty and complex one, you know, that really contributes well to the story and drives home the weight of these themes. Conversely, the legitimate Mongol villains are also presented intelligently, and far from being mindless barbaric hordes, we have to cut our way through and defeat. Khotan Khan is portrayed as both ruthless, but also versed in diplomacy as much as warfare. He clearly sees the value in negotiation, uh, and leverage, and the fact that Lord Shimura is kept alive and has frequent dialogues with Khan is evidence of this, learning the Japanese language. He sees the necessity and the value of trying to communicate and convert those that he has conquered. But more tellingly, and a great insight to our enemy, is that we have the scenario between Khan, Jin, and Yuna's brother. And this was a great sequence, as we see the intersection between the ruthless and the diplomatic at work here. You know, Jin has value to the Khan, while Taka does not. And so a coercion tactic is to kill what isn't valuable in order to shift those with influence, you know, over to his side. It was a great interfacing between Jin and the Khan. And although the game story is arguably more about Jin than it is specifically about the Mongols, I think Khotan Khan was well characterised insofar as he was needed. And also, as mentioned earlier, the idea of the samurai as a social class is augmented by this contrast with the Mongols. Uh, and as Khotan Khan himself states during the game, the samurai pride themselves on their honour code, and that makes them predictable and easy to break. And this is how they are not only distinguished from the Mongols, but also how Jin is distinguished you know, between these two warring parties, because of course he departs from the samurai and this predictability by becoming the ghost, who has no honour code uh, and has no limits, you know, uh, with regards to this strict hierarchy of the samurai. Now, turning to the end of Act 2 and the taking of Shimura Castle, we have an important turning point in the game, wherein Jin arguably, irrevocably transitions to the ghost persona and makes what some might consider to be a fatal mistake, which is up for debate, I suppose. But this is where Jin chooses to poison the Mongol garrison stationed at his uncle's castle, rather than fighting them head on, as had previously been discussed. Now, the poisoning scenario is interesting because it lays out in pretty uncertain terms the diverging approach to the Mongol problem between the samurai and the ghost, and it causes an irrevocable rift between Lord Shimura and Jin. And it also shows, I think, 
the follies of a relentless win at all costs mentality, since the immediate repercussions of this act is that the Mongols start poisoning the townships of, of Shishima Island in, in retaliation. So it's an interesting tangent of the story, because until this point, we might consider that Jin is a more modern minded, impassioned figure compared to his honor bound, you know, traditionalist peers, you know, the samurai. And since he's the hero that we play as, most of us probably see things from his perspective and, and perhaps side with him and how he approaches things. But the issue around the poisoning is interesting because it perhaps shifts our perception of him slightly, and we now understand partly why the samurai adhere to their standards and their code of conduct in the first place. And indeed, just deviating slightly, I was reading an interesting article called Clean Hands by Anand Golpal recently in The New Yorker, and he discussed this concept of what constitutes fairness and equality in times of war and where lines are drawn around morality and a level playing field in battle. And it covers a range of things, such as the church attempting to ban the use of crossbows in the Middle Ages, since crossbowed offered you know, such a devastating advantage to those that used them, all the way through to you know, asphyxiating gases, um, such as mustard gas, which were banned in World War II because they were so damaging in World War I, all the way through to like the Geneva Convention and, and rules of humane warfare, which is a very strange term. But, you know, it's interesting to think about these parameters that exist and what's permissible and what's not permissible uh, on the field of battle. You know, it, it just reminded me of that article because the Samurai Code of Honour and the Code of Bushido is very closely bound up with that, you know, and what we might consider to be fair or humane warfare. So, you know, looking back at Jin and his decision to murder these Mongols by poisoning them, you know, they didn't even have a fighting chance. It does throw this question into Ghost of Tsushima, and I found it quite an interesting aspect of the game story, as to whether we as players think he acted correctly in that particular sequence. Now, moving into the climactic third act, we had a well-executed belly of the whale sequence, where our hero hits their lowest point and has to rebuild to their final climactic ascent, which is a common aspect of, of the hero's journey formula. In video games, this is often introduced in the form of our protagonist being imprisoned and or losing all of their hard-earned equipment, which occurs in many titles from Metal Gear Solid all the way through to Tomb Raider, Final Fantasy, and of course goes to Tsushima. The third act also begins in the wintry north of Tsushima Island, which is a great atmospheric shift from the sunlit south of the early game, and the bleak weather hints at the impending endgame, which is built gradually through reuniting our motley comrades and allies towards the final scene. Now, as I've already touched on, the victory against Khotan Khan by the time it's achieved does feel secondary within the story, I think. And even after the cutscene and celebrations, there's a lingering sense that Jin's personal arc remains unresolved, and the reconciliation between the ghost and the noble, and this definition of precisely who Jin is and where he stands is yet to be concluded. And personally, I think reconciling this with the duel between Jin and Lord Shimura and throwing Jin's final definitive decision back to the player was a really good way to do it. And so all of the linear storytelling and conflicted actions that Jin partakes in resolve at this single point which is whether we choose to spare or execute Lord Shimura. And, you know, personally speaking, I felt the decision was indicative of Jin's future and the possibility of his personal redemption, you know, if not his legal one. And what's ironic about this is that I think the redemptive option and the most forgiving option to Jin, his uncle and the memory of his father, is the decision to deliver the killing blow to Lord Shimura. And although killing a relative, or in fact anyone, is contrary to what anyone might consider to be a, a redeeming action, I felt that in the context of the story and this reclamation of samurai honour that I think perhaps Jin wants, you know, and his uncle certainly wants, this was the outcome that best befitted him. Now, of course, this is only an opinion um, that I'm expressing, and I think some who chose to spare Lord Shimura may feel that perhaps this was actually the more honourable thing for Jin to do, and exemplifies how honour and forgiveness can operate outside and evolve beyond 
the strict conditions of the samurai. And furthermore, having been partly the cause of his father's death, perhaps it was important that Jin also not be the cause of his uncle's death as well. So there are several ways that a player might interpret and act upon the end game decision. But more than anything, I think it was great in how the final decision encapsulates basically everything the game story had been built around and and working towards, you know, identity, honour, tradition, progress, all of that sort of stuff. So starting to wrap up now, I've touched on gameplay already, but I think it's worth noting that not only did it balance variety with simplicity, but it also progressed at a pace that kept the game consistently engaging and For example, the unlocking of new equipment and abilities was done from the outset of the game all the way through towards the middle and the end game, where we were unlocking things such as different battle stances, you know, the grappling hook, the fire sword, all of these different abilities. And so I I enjoyed this, and the game maintained a pace that didn't peak prematurely and didn't make Jin fully maxed out and fully equipped, you know, by Act 2. And I think a lot of this owes to more modern adventure games having a post-game, post-gameplay scenarios, such as Red Dead 2, as I've, as I've touched on. So there's potential to use all of Jin's new abilities that are unlocked towards the end of the game, you know, should we choose to, to progress through the post-game. So overall, you know, I really enjoyed the gameplay. I haven't touched too much on it, but I, I think it's worth noting that it was really enjoyable. So that about wraps up my thoughts on Ghost of Tsushima. It's a folklorish, romanticised adaptation of history uh, that I think successfully blends artistic, historical and pop cultural ideas of Japan into a very enjoyable and atmospheric game experience. The music, cinematics, gameplay and art direction harmonise and augment these thematic and aesthetic glimpses of Japan and deliver a concise and enjoyable story around Jin Sakai's identity and contemporary ideas of the samurai class system. If you got this far, thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Feel free to drop a comment below and discuss your thoughts on the game. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe, which will help my channel grow and keep you updated on my latest posts.